Hi, everybody. Uh, this, uh, today, we're going to be learning about um, yet another component of muscle physiology. Uh, in our last lesson, we talked about um, how individual muscle cells work. Today, we are going to uh, kind of zoom out in the body and talk about how uh, entire muscles work. And of course, um, the way that our biceps brachii, for example, um, actually is able to contract um, depends on the cells, but then um, there are a lot of other factors uh, that kind of work together to give rise to the functionality of the entire muscle. And so, of course, here is a list of uh, what we will be discussing in this lecture today. And so, uh, again, just to summarize, uh, we left off talking about what is called a muscle twitch. Um, and the reason why we call um, just an individual contraction of a muscle, um, you know, from motor neuron stimulation through latent period, contraction period, relaxation, this is called a single twitch. Um, after um, how muscles were originally studied um, and still are studied to this day, um, essentially uh, the model organism was uh, a frog. And so they would actually um, dissect off the calf muscles of the frog, suspend them in the air, um, uh, within a machine um, and then stimulate them and then essentially measure what happens and that is how we actually learned how muscle cells worked. Um, in fact, in the PhysioX exercise that you're going to be doing, um, that is what you're going to be simulating, right? Of course, not uh, with a real frog leg, just an animation, but um, this is honestly how we study these things. And so again, a muscle twitch is a single uh, stimulus, as we can see down here at the bottom, um, a single stimulus from a motor neuron, a brief period of, um, you know, the action potential being generated, calcium being released, binding to troponin, uh, removing tropomyosin, cross bridges being formed, and then finally uh, we enter into this uh, contraction phase where we slowly generate more and more tension or force of that muscle contraction. Um, of course, if we don't, um, ex if we don't uh, stimulate the muscle cell again, um, then calcium is going to be pumped back out of the sarcoplasm, right? And therefore, troponin um, will allow tropomyosin to roll back over those active sites on actin, and slowly cross bridges will not be able to be formed. And so the um, the sarcomeres will ultimately lengthen. And so this diagram um, just summarizes that entire process. We know that as sarcomeres shorten, right, so from Z disc to Z disc here, um, and they're all doing this in a big line, ultimately the entire muscle, right, so the muscle cell and the muscle itself, the named muscle, the biceps muscle, um, is going to produce tension here. Um, and so in general, a muscle fiber is either stimulated or it's not, right? It is either being depolarized, um, generating an action potential, doing all of that excitation, contraction, coupling stuff, um, or it's not being stimulated. And so uh, muscle fibers um, can, to some extent, exhibit this all or nothing um, stimulation. However, um, we know that you know, with the same contraction of our muscles, right, the same amount of shortening of the biceps brachii, we can lift a piece of paper, or we can lift a textbook, or we can lift, you know, a 50 pound dumbbell, right? And so the same exact movement is actually producing um, different tensions. And so how exactly do we vary the tension produced by a muscle? Um, and essentially, all of these different factors are going to come down to one thing, they're going to come down to, um, you know, if you want to increase the tension that a muscle is generating, right? So a paper versus 50 pound dumbbell, you need to increase the number of cross bridges, right? So the more um, opportunities we have for interaction between actin and myosin, the more strength that particular uh, muscle cell and muscle is able to produce. And so there are many different ways of doing this. Today, we're going to talk about four of them. Okay. Um, the other uh, variable here is, um, you know, you can increase opportunities for cross bridges all you want, but as long, but unless you have the energy available um, to actually complete those cross bridge cycles, um, you're not going to actually be able to uh, increase the tension, right? So, number of cross bridges 
and of course having the energy available to fuel that cross bridge cycle. And so again, we are talking about four different factors which vary the number of cross bridges uh, that we can form. Um, and first of all, um, the resting length of the fibers, right? So essentially, whether the muscle cell is stretched or not, um, at the time the contraction begins is going to determine um, or minimally affect how uh, much tension that muscle can produce. Um, the frequency of the stimulus, right? So whether we just stimulate it once and then wait a few minutes and then stimulate it again, or if we just rapid fire keep stimulating it over and over again. Um, the number of fibers stimulated, right? So of course, if you want to um, put down the paper and grab the dumbbell, um, you need to actually uh, stimulate more fibers. And finally, um, not all muscle fibers, are, that is muscle cells, are created equally. Um, we can trigger, we can activate different types of muscle fibers in order to increase or decrease the strength. And so let's first start talking about the length of the fibers. Um, let us zoom into some sarcomeres for a second in order to understand how this works. Um, so this, of course, is a resting length of um, a sarcomere. It is the optimal length. Um, what we can see here is a lot of um, opportunities for myosin here in blue to form cross bridges here in red, you know, as long as the muscle has actually been uh, stimulated. Okay, so essentially the zone of overlap is fairly large. Okay, now if we change the resting length, okay, so for example, if we begin a muscle contraction with a shorter muscle cell um, than optimal length, as we'll see here in a second, um, what we can tell here is that yes, the zone of overlap is huge, which means that yes, there are a lot of opportunities for actin to interact with myosin. But what's different about this situation is that the Z discs are already pretty much, you know, as close together as they can possibly be, right? So the muscle cell is already shortened, um, even if um, actin and myosin uh, do interact and cross bridges are formed. Um, essentially, um, there's not much uh, space uh, for the actin to actually be pulled anymore. Okay, on the other hand, if we stretch out those sarcomeres, if we stretch out those muscles, um, what we can see now is that um, there is very little to no zone of overlap, which means that even if calcium causes troponin to remove tropomyosin, those um, myosin heads aren't going to be able to actually bind to the active sites on actin and therefore they can't generate tension. They can't start those filaments sliding um, over one another. And so what we can see here um, is just that the length of the fiber at the beginning of the contraction is going to be really important in determining how strong that muscle contraction can be, how much tension um, can be exhibited. And so um, if you can look up in the, uh, the video, um, we can experience this and we kind of have a general feel for this, even if we've never thought about it this way before. Um, but essentially, um, whenever you make a fist, the muscles responsible for making that fist um, and um, actually moving your wrist right, anteriorly and posteriorly, um, all of those muscles are in your forearm, okay? And so here, um, the muscles that um, flex your fingers and your wrist, right, so essentially make the fist are all on the front um, of your forearm. And of course, we're going to talk about that more um, in the next section of this class. But what I want to point out now is that um, if we shorten these muscle fibers, okay, so here when we already flex our wrist, we have actually shortened the length of these muscle fibers on our forearm. Um, and so um, what we have done, if you look back to the slide here, we have actually um, you know, brought Z discs closer to Z discs, even though these muscles are not actively engaged right now. And so when we try to make a fist with our fingers, right, we're, again, we're using the same muscles that have already shortened here, your fist is super weak, right? Like it feels really awkward and you're not going to be able to make a really strong fist this way, okay? If we lengthen those muscle fibers, right? So again, we're talking about the muscles on the anterior of our forearm by 
extending our wrist in this way, we have actually stretched out those sarcomeres um, beyond their optimal length, right? And so now the zone of overlap is really small, right? And so we've actually decreased the opportunities for um, cross bridges to actually form, right? So again, if you stretch out, if you lengthen these muscle fibers here and try to make a fist, again, it's going to be a super weak fist, right? And uh, try it out yourself, right? This fist is crummy. This fist is crummy. But if we straighten our wrists, right? We have essentially produced, um, or we have essentially um, positioned our sarcomeres like this in the middle. We have optimized the zone of overlap, but there's still a lot of space for those filaments to slide over one another and pull those Z discs closer together. And so, of course, if you try to make a fist with your wrist nice and straight, that is as strong as you are possibly going to be. And of course, you can see your muscles um, moving. They are contracting, right? And so um, as the sarcomeres shorten, all of those uh, myofilaments kind of like overlap and overlap. And so your muscle gets thicker because now all of your filaments are in a smaller vertical space as opposed to being stretched out. And so your muscle is going to get much bigger, right? It's going to bulge, right? Like when you flex your biceps, they bulge um, because all of those myofilaments are together and overlap at the same time. And so um, this relationship um, can, of course, be graphed. Um, and actually, you're going to be playing around with this a little bit um, on PhysioX as well. Um, but essentially, what this uh, graph is showing us is the length tension relationship. All right, so essentially showing us that um, every muscle has an optimal resting length, and this optimal resting length um, is such that the zone of overlap is optimized, All right, lots and lots of opportunities for cross bridges to form, and also there's still a lot of space in between the end of the myosin and the Z-discs. Okay? Um, of course, when we start to shorten or stretch out lengthen, those muscles slash those sarcomeres, we see that the tension, right, the percent of maximum tension that can be produced, drops off considerably. Okay, and so generally this optimal resting length um, is about um, 75 to 130% um, of the optimal length, right? So um, if we are talking about these anterior forearm muscles here, um, a wrist that is straight up and down, right, nice and straight, like anatomical position, is approximately the optimal length. And okay? so again, we can vary the tension produced by a muscle by beginning the contraction in different positions. Okay, um, something else that you will be um, exploring on PhysioX is the fact that tension in a muscle isn't just generated actively, right? So first of all, active tension, right, is cross bridge cycles, sliding filaments, um, and so this active process, the process that we've been talking about so far. Um, and so uh, if we go back here, we can see that there's this nice, um, you know, this nice curve here. Um, and uh, on this particular graph, that looks an awful lot like this red line right here. Okay, and so that's exactly what it is. So relative to resting length, and here is the force of that twitch. Um, and so yes, there is an optimal resting length um, in order to generate the most tension. Um, but what we can also see is this blue line, this passive force that is generated. And so what we can notice first and foremost here is that the longer we stretch that muscle, Right, so these muscles are super stretched. These ones are a bit shorter. Um, so the longer we stretch that muscle, we see that the passive force increases significantly for every little bit of additional stretch there is in the muscle. And so what the heck is happening here? Well, essentially, you have, of course, tendons, right? So this is your calf muscle, your gastrocnemius, um, those uh, connective tissue sheaths. All right, so the um, epimysium, for example, as well as the fascia surrounding that, um, ultimately comes together to form a tendon, which of course attaches to the periosteum of, um, in this case, the calcaneus, the heel bone. Um, as you stretch this muscle more and more and more, um, you risk actually pulling those muscles 
apart, right? So actually damaging your muscles. And so these um, connective tissue structures, this um, Achilles tendon or calcaneal tendon um, actually exerts tension, but back in the other way, right? And so um, in this way, um, we protect our muscles. We can't possibly pull them apart um, because those tendons are so strong and they're pulling back in the other direction, um, again, to protect you. Okay. Um, and so this exerts passive force, right? It's not, um, you know, cross bridge cycles. This is merely um, just the quality of this connective tissue. You can only stretch it so far. Okay, um, and so why do we stretch to begin with? Right, this is a little bit off topic, but um, surely an important thing to understand. Um, so stretching, right, a good thing. You're supposed to stretch before and after exercise. Um, when you get up in the morning, you know, you do um, yoga, so stretching exercises. So what exactly is stretching doing? Um, first of all, when you stretch your muscles beyond their optimal length, right, you can start to feel that passive force to feel the actual stretch. Um, and so when this passive force um, actually begins, right, essentially what's happening in your muscles or in your sarcomeres is that those Z discs have been pulled apart so much that now there is no zone of overlap. And so, um, this is a good thing for your muscles, for the health of your muscles, because um, sometimes in the process of um, using your muscles, those myofilaments are going to get a little bit tangled up. And so when you stretch your muscles, right, Z discs being pulled apart, now there's no zone of overlap. So when you release the stretch, all of a sudden those myofilaments can, um, can weave together, right, can overlap appropriately, and they're not going to be tangled up. So ultimately, stretching, right, lots of stretching, um, can, first of all, um, reorganize your muscles so that they can be more functional and therefore can be stronger, okay? Um, also, you increase the compliance of the tendons, right? And so um, essentially, you can become more flexible, okay? Um, you can, um, well, th this flexibility isn't just cool so that you can like move your body in weird ways, but essentially like if you, um, you know, are at the gym or you're playing sports or something and you move in a weird way, if your tendons are uh, more pliable, they are going to protect you from injury a lot more than if they were super stiff, right? Um, and so um, lots of research has shown that um, chronic stretching, so this is uh, multiple times a week, even if it's just for 10 to 15 minutes, um, can of course increase flexibility, as you might imagine, right? So um, increase flexibility, increase, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> reduce muscle strains, right? So again, if you move in a weird way, um, more flexible, more compliant uh, tendons are going to give a little bit more uh, before the muscle actually starts to tear. Um, also, by continually telling your body, telling your muscles that, hey, we want to be able to stretch. We want to be able to stretch farther and farther and farther. Um, this actually has been shown to increase sarcomeres, right? And so if you keep on um, completing the same type of action over and over again, um, you are essentially training your body um, or actually modifying your tissues to accommodate this new type of action. Um, and actually, we'll talk about that more um, in this lecture, and we'll talk about that when we get into bones as well, but your body is continually rem remodeling itself. And so if you keep telling your body, stretch, 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 um, essentially, um, they are going, your muscles are going to get longer so that they can accommodate this longer muscle length. Um, and so you're increasing sarcomeres. And more sarcomeres equals more cross bridges, more cross bridges equals more strength. And so you are literally getting stronger just by stretching your muscles, right? Even if you're not going to the gym and weightlifting all the time, you are increasing your strength. Nice. So that was a little bit of an aside, but um, I think it's important um, to know why we do things sometimes, right? Um, and just the importance of things like stretching. Okay, um, so first of all, in order to change the tension in a muscle, we can change the length, the initial length of that muscle. Secondly, we can stimulate that muscle more often. Okay, so um, what we can see here um, is a single muscle twitch. Okay, here is 
um, the stimulus from a motor neuron or from um, some kind of a machine, okay, um, like you'll do in PhysioX. Um, and what we can see is a brief latent period. Then we can see a slow, you know, relatively slow, of course, this is imperceptibly slow. Um, so, um, so here is the generation of tension, again, sarcomere shortening, um, and without further stimulation, calcium is pumped back out of the sarcoplasm and essentially the muscle is going to relax. Now, if we let the muscle cell, or muscles, all of them, um, relax entirely so that the conditions are the same as they were before the stimulus, okay, that is 40,000 times higher calcium within the sarcoplasm reticulum than out in the sarcoplasm, etc. cetera, um, essentially the next stimulus is going to produce the same exact strength. Right, so the same thing, the same uh, number of cross bridges, the same amount of tension is produced. Um, however, if we stimulate this muscle again before it relaxes, okay, so what we can see here is a second stimulus has occurred before the first muscle twitch has dissipated, before the muscle cell has completely relaxed and completely pumped all of that calcium back out of the sarcoplasm. And so what we can see um, is that um, when the muscle cell depolarizes again, again, it is going to cause calcium to flood out of the sarcoplasm reticulum, but this time there's already calcium in the sarcoplasm reticulum, okay? There's already cross bridges. These things are already happening, okay? And so now we can actually generate even more tension because there is still calcium left over. Um, there still are cross bridges um, that are engaged. Okay, and so this concept is called um, two things, right? It's anatomy. Why name something once if we can't name it two or three times? Here, we can call this either wave summation or twitch summation, right? And so we have summed together the two waves, right? Um, or we have summed together the two twitches, right? You can use either one. Um, it's all good. Okay, um, and so in order to produce wave summation, your second action potential stimulus has to arrive before the relaxation phase is complete, right? So this produces um, additional force, okay? And again, this is all tied back to the fact that there is still calcium left over in the sarcoplasm, okay? Um, next, we have tetanus, right? And so this is not the type of tetanus that we talked about before that you get vaccines against that paralyzes you. This is a normal part of muscle physiology um, and something that we actually um, exhibit uh, all the time. Um, and so what we can see in this graph below or in this myogram, um, of course, is tension. So how strong is this particular muscle cell? Um, also down here, we can see the stimuli. So each one of these S's here is another action potential. And so here is a single muscle twitch. Here we start to see wave summation. Right, so another uh, twitch has occurred or has been stimulated before the muscle has completely relaxed. Um, so it starts to relax a little bit and then we stimulate it again. And so um, in this case, we get a stronger contraction after this second stimulus. Okay, tetanus on the other hand um, is similar to wave summation, but this time, um, you are stimulating the muscle cell so rapidly, right? So even more rapidly than wave summation and more continuously that essentially all of those little muscle twitches fuse together. And so you can produce a stronger and stronger and stronger contraction without even realizing like twitch, 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 twitch. Instead, it is um, a smooth contraction, right? So you can think about this, um, well, think about um, holding a glass and pouring liquid into that glass, okay? So your, you know, muscles are staying at the same length, whatever, um, but they are actually producing a stronger and stronger and stronger contraction. And so what's happening is that you are stimulating those muscle cells uh, more and more frequently. And so you are getting stronger and stronger, but you don't realize that, you know, twitch, 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 these um, 
these twitches have actually fused together into a smooth, sustained contraction. Okay, um, and so uh, generally there's no sign of relaxation, um, at least consciously, until you are fatigued, until um, you run out of ATP. Okay, um, and so what we experience on a daily basis um, is called, again, two different terms, either unfused tetanus or incomplete tetanus. Um, and again, um, this is an increased uh, stimulus frequency. So we start sending action potentials faster and faster and faster, um, and this produces a smooth, sustained contraction. Um, now there is another type of um, tetanus, and this is fused or complete tetanus. And so this um, phenomenon occurs when you just stimulate the heck out of the muscle, right? So what we can see here is that um, pretty much as soon as the cell is repolarized, right? So as soon as those sodium channels close again, we stimulate it again. So pretty much during that um, relative refractory period, Right? We just generate more and more and more action potentials. And so in this situation, um, the muscle cells have absolutely no time for relaxation. So we're just dumping all of the calcium possible um, out of that sarcoplasmic reticulum. The muscles are fully engaged. Um, and as we can see, they are actually able to produce um, much, much more strength than any of these other scenarios. Okay, in fact, um, this is so much more strength that we would consider it kind of superhuman, right? And so fused or complete tetanus is um, usually only associated with the fight or flight response. Um, so when you are in an oh crap situation, right? So you see somebody get hit by a car and you run over and you lift the car to save this person. Um, normal people can't just go over and like lift up a car, but we've, you know, seen stories that this kind of superhuman strength is possible in really rare conditions or in really rare situations. And so um, those situations are always associated with the fight or flight response. And it is possible that we individually will never actually experience complete or fused tetanus. Okay, so again, um, this is um, this is what we would experience on a daily basis. Um, it is different than wave summation in that there is very little time for relaxation of the muscle. And so essentially we produce a stronger and stronger contraction with um, very smoothly. Okay. Um, there is one additional type of um, mechanism for actually increasing the tension in your muscles. Um, and that's called TREP or TREPA um, after the German word for staircase. Um, and essentially um, what's happening here is, um, all right, we can stimulate a muscle and allow it to relax, right? So we have shortened the sarcomeres and then we have allowed those sarcomeres to go back to their original position, right? To lengthen out to their original position. But then before all of the calcium is pumped back uh, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum um, and before the muscle has completely um, reset, um, we can stimulate the muscle again, right? And so this time um, the contraction is going to be stronger, right? Again, full contraction, full relaxation. We stimulate it again. Full contraction, full relaxation, right? And so we can keep on doing this um, over and over again until we reach this maximum, um, this maximum uh, contraction uh, tension, okay? Um, and so from there, once we have... Um, reach this maximum tension, every subsequent um, stimulus is going to produce this much stronger contraction. Um, and so this not only has, um, has to do with the amount of calcium in the sarcoplasm, um, it actually has more to do with um, kind of warming up the muscle, right? So when the muscle is contracting, it's getting warmer and warmer. And so that increases um, the activity of the enzymes within the muscles, um, and therefore they get a lot more efficient um, with subsequent stimuli. And so um, this is a staircase, right, 
um, we could see, yes, an increase in the contraction strength, but what makes TREP different than uh, unfused tetanus is that the muscle relaxes before um, the second stimulus arrives, right? So we see the full twitch, right? So contraction, relaxation, back down to normal, contraction, relaxation, back down to normal, etc. cetera. Um, and so why the heck would we want this? Well, this is very important, um, particularly in our cardiomyocytes, in our cardiac muscle. Um, so essentially the heart muscle um, contracts to pump blood out of the heart, but then after it contracts, it needs to fill up with blood once again. So those chambers, atria and ventricles, have to fill up with blood once again in order for that blood to then be pumped back out into the body and therefore circulate the blood throughout the blood vessels. Um, and so the cardiac muscle has to fully contract and then fully relax, opening up as much as physically possible to let as much blood into those ventricles before contracting once again. And so TREP is really important for a full contraction and a full relaxation in the cardiac muscle in particular. Okay. Um, here we can see all of these different phenomena um, next to each other, right? So here we can see um, the tension of, for example, the cardiac muscle, full contraction, full relaxation, all the way back down to zero, but we do get this nice little staircase effect and we get a topping out at a particular um, tension. All right, here is wave summation, okay? So essentially um, increasing the tension by increasing the um, frequency of the stimuli. Um, this is similar and different to incomplete tetanus. Incomplete tetanus um, increases the tension even more, um, but ultimately it tops out at some smooth, sustained contraction. Okay, so, uh, and finally, uh, complete tetanus, we can get the maximum tension physically possible in a muscle. This almost never happens, um, and there is no relaxation period whatsoever in between the stimuli. And again, um, in PhysioX, you are going to be playing with all of these. Okay, so in order to increase the tension of a muscle, we have to begin the contraction with the optimal length. We can increase the frequency of the action potentials of the stimuli to that muscle, and we can call upon more muscle fibers. Okay, so now we're thinking about the entire muscle. Of course, the entire muscle isn't made up of just individual muscle cells. It's made up of thousands of muscle cells. Um, and so um, we can call upon more muscle cells by sending more action potentials down more motor neurons. Okay, and so each motor neuron does not activate, does not talk to a single muscle cell. Okay, so what we can see here is the spinal cord like we've been talking about. Here is um, the ventral root. So we can see motor neurons, right? Their action potentials travel down these motor neurons, out the ventral root, out the spinal nerve, and ultimately down to our skeletal muscles. Okay, we can see that the axon actually branches so that it talks to, right? It is actually capable of um, activating two different myocytes or myofibers. Okay. Um, this green motor neuron here can talk to three uh, muscle cells. Okay, and so each motor neuron is capable of interacting with multiple muscle cells, all of the muscle cells um, activated by a single motor neuron is called a motor unit. And so here we can see motor unit two has three muscle cells, motor unit one has two muscle cells. Okay, so that is a motor unit. Um, now, not all motor units are created equally. Um, if you compare the size of motor units um, between muscles, they will vary considerably. So for example, your facial muscles right, um, have, have to communicate um, emotions, for example, and in order to do so, just a tiny movement of your um, 
of your eyebrows, for example, can portray completely different emotions. Um, and so we want to be able to have really fine control over those muscles so that we don't always look surprised or always look ticked off. Okay, so we want really fine control. And so the motor units of facial muscles, for example, are very tiny. They might have only a few muscle cells per motor neuron. Okay, other muscles um, really don't need as much fine control. So for example, your uh, calf muscles or your quadriceps femoris muscles, um, these, you know, it doesn't matter um, if they move just a little bit, right? In general, we want um, a lot of movement, a lot of strength and contraction all at the same time. And so we actually have thousands of um, muscle cells within each motor nerve or within each motor unit within those muscles so that we can very efficiently say hey contract right um move this entire larger structure um and, and so um this is more efficient because instead of sending 500 action potentials down 500 neurons now we can send one action potential um to 500 um different cells Okay. Um, okay. Uh, at all times, there are motor units that are engaged, right? So even if you are just sitting there on the couch right now, you have lots of motor units that are, um, that are engaged even in your legs, right? Um, you know, your legs are just kind of lounging there, but you still have some motor units that are being engaged. And so this is called muscle tone or muscle tonus. Um, it's just resting tension. It's kind of in the background. Um, and so it's not always the same motor units that are engaged. Motor unit one will be engaged and then two and then three and essentially um, just uh, creating um, this natural resting tone. Okay. Um, and so once again, if we want to increase the tension or the strength that a muscle is um, exerting, we can recruit more motor units. Okay. And so um, what we can see here um, is a cross section through a muscle. The tiny circles here are muscle cells, myocytes, myofibers. Um, the ones that are colored in are activated, right? So they are being stimulated by their motor neuron. Okay. Um, if we stimulate um, our muscle cells, right? The, our muscles, um, you know, above threshold, um, and we keep increasing the strength of that stimulus, right? Like someone keeps pouring into the glass um, beyond what individual motor units can, um, can sustain. So now we need to start engaging more and more of these cells until ultimately all of the motor units are engaged. Um, They're all contracting fully. Um, and so this will give us a maximal contraction within that muscle. And so again, we get more and more and more tension up to a certain point, right? Um, we can't just lift, you know, car, house, whatever, um, when all of these motor units are engaged. Um, and so in general, we start recruiting the smallest motor units first. Um, so um, not just with a few cells, but also, um, motor units with smaller cells, right? So we uh, start out small and we get bigger and bigger and bigger um, until we recruit the largest of all of those fibers. Um, if you are sustaining a contraction for a while, right? Not only can we produce unfused tetanus within individual cells, but also we can produce this smooth sustained contraction um, by kind of rotating through those motor units. Okay, and so we can see here is time um, and tension being produced by that muscle. Um, we stimulate motor unit one. Okay, and we recruit a second, a motor unit two. And so the ultimate tension of the entire muscle is way up here, right? So the tension of uh, as many motor units are engaged is going to be summed together to produce the total tension in the entire muscle. Okay, now motor unit one and motor unit two are not, um, uh, what's the word, uh, defatigable, right? They are going to tire out over time. Um, and so instead of letting them become completely 
fatigued, we actually stimulate motor unit one, allow it to relax. Stimulate motor unit two, allow it to relax. Stimulate another motor unit and allow it to relax. And so ultimately, um, we see that there is this nice um, rotation, nice working together, kind of like a relay race here, um, to produce a pretty consistent tension level. Okay, um, and so what happens if you try to sustain that contraction for too long? Um, and so anyone who's uh, done isometric uh, workouts, right, so yoga or planking, right, um, you'll notice that um, you start to shake, <laughs> right, eventually. Um, and of course, this depends on um, how you trained your body, of course. Um, but muscle shaking, what the heck is that? Well, essentially, um, if you keep holding position, your um, cross bridge cycles have to keep running, right? So to keep that muscle length um, consistent, um, cross bridges have to keep being made. And so that is a really energy intensive process. It burns through all sorts of ATP. Um, and so um, over time, uh, you burn through all of your ATP in, for example, motor unit three, right? So this one is fatigued. We have to now make more ATP, and we'll get into that here um, in the next section here. Um, but we need to make more ATP, but while that process is happening, all of a sudden motor unit three taps out, right? And so you have motor unit one and two producing this much tension, but once motor unit th three is not engaging anymore, then you're going to get a dip in this tension until the next motor unit picks up. And so that leaves tension not, tension not, tension not. And so this is happening really fast. And so that's why you start to shake, okay? Um, so, at this point, um, we have talked about how increasing the number of cross bridges increases the tension that's produced in a muscle. Um, we can change the length of the fibers, we can increase the frequency stimulus, and we can um, recruit more muscle fibers or motor units. The fourth and final type or uh, mechanism for increasing the, um, sorry, the uh, force of contraction is to recruit particular types of muscle fibers. Okay. Um, again, not all muscle fibers are created equally. They differ in structure and therefore they differ in function. Okay. Um, perhaps you guys have heard of this before. We're going to go in a little bit more detail now, um, but certain muscle fibers are highly adapted for speed and strength, right? So you're sprinting, bodybuilding kind of muscles. Others are meant for endurance. Okay. So the um, many reps, little weight, or the going out and running a marathon as opposed to a sprint. Okay, and so on that note, um, we're all surely aware, um, regardless of how athletic we are, that we can't sprint forever, right? And so if we look at this graph here, we can see that um, the longer the race, or the longer that you're actually uh, contracting your muscles, exerting yourself, um, the slower you are, no matter how strong of an athlete you are, you can't sprint for an entire marathon, okay? Short duration, okay? So just a really short run right here, you can be super fast, but the longer the race, the slower on average you're going to go. And so speed is reduced for longer distances. So inherently we have all experienced this balance between strength, right? So, you know, lots of weight, few reps, and endurance, right? Lots of reps, little weight, okay? Um, and so all of this ties back to the energy metabolism in our muscles, okay? Um, we have many different types of fuel sources, right? Ultimately, the cross bridge cycles are fueled by ATP, but where do we get that ATP? Well, there's a lot of different places that we can do that. Um, and so um, we're going to walk through these here in just a moment, but um, just as a brief overview, um, ATP, is available to some extent in our muscle cells. Um, also, we have um, some other ready energy called phosphocreatine or creatine phosphate, um, another ready source of energy. Um, once that is exhausted, we start burning through what is called glycogen. Remember, this is a polysaccharide. Um, we can burn through glycogen pretty quickly, right? So get energy almost right away. Um, but once that is gone, we have to start dipping into other sources of energy. These other sources happen to take a little bit more time and effort in order to get ATP out of them. And so the fact that it takes longer to get ATP means that you can't complete cross bridge cycles so quickly, you have to slow down because there literally is not enough energy to fuel those cycles. 
Okay, so energy sources in our muscles. Again, this determines um, how our muscles work. Um, and of course, um, keep in mind that we have different types of muscle cells that are um, adapted for strength versus endurance. And again, that's all tied back to this, right? So I'm going coming back to those different types of muscle fibers. Okay, um, so um, this graph up here <clears throat> shows us the duration of an exercise, right? So the beginning of an exercise, if you keep on working out or running, um, at, or if you continue longer, right, for hours and hours. Um, and these are um, the energy sources, right? So at these different periods um, during your physical exertion, what energy sources are you using? And so first and foremost, for the first few seconds, you're burning through ATP. So here is ATP. Um, note that there is a certain amount of it present within your muscle cells, um, you know, as long as they've been given the opportunity to do so. But this ATP is exhausted, um, no pun intended, quite quickly, right? So just for a few seconds. And so from there, um, you have to start digging into other sources. The next source that you work through um, is called creatine phosphate. Um, and so down here, we can see um, just a representation of a molecule here. Here is creatine phosphate because it has a phosphate added to it. Here is ADP. Remember, ADP is the um, the low energy form of this molecule. And in order to get back to ATP, which as we know, fuels the cross bridge cycle over here, we can literally take phosphate off of CP or creatine phosphate, tack it onto ADP, and therefore make ATP. Okay, and so um, this process, again, is super fast. Phosphate literally jumps onto ADP and can be used right away in the cross bridge cycle. Um, so, uh, we can use creatine phosphate for a few more seconds. Um, and so you guys might actually recognize uh, this term creatine phosphate because a lot of, um, or there are a lot of uh, energy supplements out there that contain creatine phosphate. And so lots of bodybuilders might like to take this, but in general, CP is burnt through in a few seconds and then it's not doing a darn thing for you. And that's assuming that it even gets into your muscles without being digested first. So really, um, you can train your muscles to have more or less CP or more or less glycogen. Um, there's lots of cool resources online about that. Um, but energy supplements, right? Just taking pure CP is not doing you a darn bit of good for more than a few seconds tops. All right, um, hopefully after, uh, after this class, you guys will question um, what you're putting into your bodies a little bit more. Right. Um, okay. So after ATP and CP are depleted, right? So we're talking within like seven to 10 seconds here. Um, muscles have to use energy from other biomolecules, right? So the pretty much the bigger the molecule, the more energy is stored within those molecules um, in order to break that energy free and essentially um, kind of funnel it into ATP. Um, not getting into the chemistry or physics of this, but um, in order to take a big clunky molecule and put that energy into ATP, we need to use a process called respiration. <clears throat> um, and so respiration happens in a few different ways, uses a few different types of molecules. What molecules does it use? First of all, it uses glycogen. Okay, and glycogen, remember, is a polysaccharide. So lots of glucose molecules tacked together um, into these big branched um, globby molecules. And so when you, um, when you burn through your ready energy, you can actually take glucose and just like break it off of glycogen and throw it right into this respiration process. Okay, so um, there's lots of glycogen in your muscles, there's lots of glycogen in your lipids. Um, and so um, we can start breaking this down when we need it. Okay, and so um, just as a reminder, right, so a throwback to the last exam, um, when energy is in abundance, right? So when you're sitting on the couch eating candy bars, you have lots of excess glucose um, entering your system. You can dehydrate those glucose molecules, right? Removing water and ultimately make glucose or make glycogen, okay? And so this is called glycogenesis. We are generating glycogen, right? And so each one of these tiny little things here is a glucose, right? And so when you get up off the couch, and go take a jog, you have plenty of energy, plenty of glucose stored as glycogen, 
ready to make ATP. Okay. Um, we also have glucose in our blood, right? So um, we talked about this on the first day of class, but essentially we like to keep our blood glucose between 70 and 100. Um, if you're diabetic, you can you know, often get a little bit higher than that, but generally 70 to 100 is what we shoot for. Um, it's really important to have this much glucose in your blood so that when your muscles start working, you can actually start pulling glucose out of the blood and again, throwing it right into this respiration process. Okay, um, fats, right? Of course, if you are exercising a lot, you um, maybe want to start burning fat. Um, and so, yes, there's a ton of energy um, stored in fat, and we can use fats in a certain type of respiration. Um, we can also start breaking down proteins, right? Again, any type, type of big um, biomolecule stores energy, right? So um, what this image is showing you here is that we can use any of these types of molecules, right? Lipids, carbs, or proteins in order to generate um, lots of ATP. Now, for the most part, um, the easiest types of biomolecules from which um, to make ATP are the carbohydrates. And so we can use these um, to make glycogen when there's a lot of extra energy. We can break down glycogen um, when we need that extra energy, right? So glycogenolysis, lysis is breaking down, and so we break down glycogen. Okay, and so um, we can use the carbs throughout this entire process, and we'll look at that distinction here in just a second, um, but we can also use proteins and fats and lipids within our mitochondria, right, to get lots and lots and lots of ATP. All right, so again, let's talk about that. Okay, so um, again, after your ready sources of energy are depleted, you can use the glucose in your cells, you can use the glucose in your blood, you can use the glucose stored as glycogen, right? So this glucose, right, after it's been broken off of glycogen, um, can actually be processed or like broken down to some extent in the cytoplasm of your muscle cells. Okay, and this process is called glycolysis. It is also called anaerobic respiration. So an, not or without, air. So without air. So this part of respiration does not require any oxygen in order for these uh, reactions to be catalyzed. Okay, and so um, glycolysis, again, is going to take a glucose molecule, right, whether it was just floating in the blood or we broke it off of a glycogen, and it is going to manipulate it in uh, certain ways, and it's using like 60 or so different enzymes in order to do so. Very complicated process. Maybe you remember it from taking a bio class, um, but essentially we start with glucose, we break it in half, um, and we get a net two ATP out of that process. Okay, so this process is fast. It doesn't take any specialized organelles, right? So no mitochondria or anything, um, and it doesn't require oxygen. Okay, so the perks to anaerobic respiration, also called glycolysis, um, is that it's super fast, okay? And so as soon as we use up all of our ready energy, we can start this process of anaerobic respiration um, pretty darn quickly, and we can start to compensate for those, um, for the lack of ATP. All right, so super fast. Um, also, no oxygen is required. You might say, well, we always have oxygen in our body, right? We're always breathing. But of course, if you are um, exerting yourself so much, um, all of your muscles that you are using are going to be demanding oxygen. And so there's not actually enough oxygen to go around to fuel these processes in all of your cells at the same time. Right, and so actually having a process that doesn't require abundant amounts of oxygen is going to be really helpful in sustaining um, your activity. Okay, um, the drawback to this is that it really doesn't make much ATP, so not much bang for your buck here. One glucose molecule, two ATP, right, so that's two cross bridge cycles really not getting much out of it. Um, and as a side effect of that minimal production of ATP, you're making a lot of heat, right? So you are, um, th there's still a lot of energy left over in what's left of the glucose molecules or within that pyruvate there. And so you produce lots and lots of heat. And so if you are um, exercising um, 
you know, you might be doing okay for a little while and then all of a sudden you'll just start sweating profusely. Well, that is when you actually um, have surpassed a certain threshold and are depending more on anaerobic respiration. All right, so you start to sweat because you're producing um, so much extra heat. All right, the other drawback to this process, um, not that it's you know bad or whatever, just the side effects, um, is that um, not only does it produce a lot of heat for minimal ATP, it also produces acid, right? It produces lactate or lactic acid. Um, and essentially what's going on here is that um, in the process of glycolysis, so breaking um, this six carbon glucose into two, three carbon pyruvates is that um, you essentially have to like pull, <laughs> uh, it's my dog. Um, you have to pull electrons off of these molecules and essentially those electrons um, and protons have to go somewhere. And so um, you use this, um, what is called NAD plus molecule to essentially recycle um, or pick up those extra hydrogens. Um, they have to go somewhere. You have to keep on using this NAD plus over and over again. And so essentially NAD plus picks up hydrogens and it dumps it on a molecule um, that makes, or that is lactic acid. Okay. And so this um, produces an acid. This makes um, your breathing change. It makes your pH of your body change. Um, and of course, uh, it gives you that little cramp in your side, right? So it's, um, it can be uncomfortable as well, okay? So absolutely, we need this anaerobic respiration. Um, it's fast, it gets us through a brief period, um, and it, um, but it's not the only thing that we should be using. Um, anything that we're doing for longer than a couple minutes has to be fueled by aerobic respiration. And so what is aerobic respiration? Um, essentially the leftovers from glycolysis, you know, so took a six carbon glucose, broke it in half into two pyruvates. Those leftover molecules, those pyruvates are each going to enter into the mitochondria. And so the mitochondria completes um, Calvin cycle. Um, it also completes the or sorry, the, the Krebs cycle, oh my gosh, uh, it's photosynthesis. Um, it completes the electron transport chain and essentially through all of these different mechanisms, you get about 36 ATP for each glucose molecule. Um, and so this of course is a lot more bang for your buck than just two ATP, that's 36 um, cross bridge cycles and therefore lots and lots of movement and shortening of the sarcomeres. Um, so again, um, Anytime you're going to be doing an exercise for more than a couple minutes, you need to employ this aerobic metabolism so that you can actually keep up with that exercise. Um, drawback, it's kind of slow, right? For all of these crazy steps to happen, which involves pumping hydrogen ions and all sorts of crazy things, um, it's a little bit slow. And so you can't, um, you can't contract your muscles as forcefully um, because you don't have as much um, ATP being as, being generated as quickly. Um, the other um, drawback is that oxygen is required. And so when you are um, exercising, of course, you have to increase your heart rate, increase your uh, breathing rates um, to hopefully get oxygen to as many tissues as possible. But again, there is a limit to how much oxygen is actually available. Um, Cool things, we like this because it produces lots and lots of ATP, right? So it gives you lots and lots of bang for your buck. Um, the last benefit to aerobic respiration that we'll talk about is the fact that it can use all of these different processes, right? So the only thing glycolysis can use is just plain old glucose, right? Whether it's coming from glycogen or not. Um, but the mitochondria has a lot wider range of molecules that it can actually use. So what we can see down here is um, all of this stuff is happening within the mitochondria. And so we can use proteins and we can use fats as well. And so um, if you want to burn through fat, you can't just do really fast, really high weight exercises. You need to do the more um, long-term exercises, probably with a little bit lower weights, right? So um, burning fats takes 
high reps, low weight, right? Just, just so you know. <laughs> um, okay, so um, kind of three different systems here. Um, first of all, um, if you're only going to be sprinting for a couple seconds, you can probably get away with just using um, the two ready energy sources, ATP and creatine phosphate. Um, if you are maybe a swimmer, so um, explosive, strong movements for just a couple minutes, you can get away with using your anaerobic or glycolytic respiration. All right, so just short-term activities, your, um, your anaerobic respiration can sustain these, um, these movements. Um, but if you're going to be working out for longer than a couple minutes, you really need to use aerobic respiration. Um, and so this is, um, again, a much slower process. And as a result, you are slower, right? You are not quite as strong, right? Because it takes a while to chug through those proteins, lipids, um, and pyruvate molecules as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's why we can't sprint forever because um, aerobic respiration cannot support long-term sprinting. Okay, so um, the reason we started talking about metabolism is because our muscle fibers, right, these muscle cells um, are specialized for either endurance or um, strength. Um, and so each of our muscle fibers um, depends on one of those types of metabolism a lot more strongly. Yes, all muscle cells can do all of those things, absolutely. But um, certain cells are really great at the aerobic and certain cells are really great at the anaerobic. Okay, and so what types of muscle cells do we have? Uh, first of all, we have, um, again, so many different names. Um, we have slow fibers or slow twitch fibers, which are also called slow oxidative fibers which are also called type 1 fibers, right? So you will see all of these different terms and you really need to be familiar with all of them. Okay, so as the name suggests, these are slow and they are oxidative, so they require oxygen, therefore aerobic respiration, and of course this process is a little bit slower to get going and to sustain itself. Okay, um, on kind of the other end of the spectrum, we have fast fast twitch fibers, we have fast glycolytic fibers, we have type 2B fibers, right? So lots and lots of different names. Um, but as the names do suggest to you, they are fast, right? So explosive bursts of strength, depending on glycolysis, right? So glycolytic here, glycolysis, this is anaerobic respiration. And so the slow fibers are great for endurance, right? Long time, but a little bit, um, slower or not as strong. Um, the fast glycolytic fibers um, depend on anaerobic respiration and therefore, um, just a second here, everybody. I'm losing battery here. So I'm gonna pause for just a second. Okay, back to it. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, okay, so what I was saying was uh, the Slow twitch fibers are high endurance, low strength. The fast fibers are um, low endurance, high strength. Okay, and so um, each of our human muscles are actually a combination of both of these types of fibers. Um, so if we take a look down here, we'll see the slow twitch fibers are um, huh, interesting. Ah, <laughs> um, oh, sorry everybody. Um, <coughs> okay, so we can see the slow twitch fibers are in red here, and we can see that the fast twitch fibers are uh, kind of lighter color here, um, the whiter fibers, um, and so all of our muscles, again, are a combination of the slow and fast fibers. Um, and essentially, depending on what you do with your life, um, whether you are a uh, long-term runner, for example, all right, so you're doing uh, low strength, high endurance exercises, or if you are a bodybuilder doing high strength, um, low endurance exercises, this actually um, will change the 
um, relative abundance of these fibers within your own muscles. Okay. Um, there is another type of fiber, um, and these are the intermediate fibers, and so essentially they have um, some things in common with the fast and some things in common with the slow. Um, we can call them fast oxidative fibers as well, so they are also really good at aerobic respiration, but they also have some of those fast um, explosive uh, movement kind of, um, kind of functions. Okay, so let's just make a, um, a chart here. Um, Abundance of CP, right? So fast versus slow twitch. Um, we're just going to talk about these two as opposed to all three of them um, and just kind of think about um, what uh, characteristics uh, you'd expect or would make sense to produce high endurance, low strength or low strength, high endurance. Okay, um, so abundance of CP. So remember that this is ready energy. Um, and so if you are completing explosive bursts of strength that taper out really quickly within a few seconds to a few minutes, um, you might imagine that as a fiber, you should have a lot of CP. Um, and so fast switch fibers are going to have a lot more creatine phosphate than slow twitch fibers are. Um, so normally I'd write this on the whiteboard with you guys, but um. Yeah, I'm gonna draw off my mouse today. <laughs> um, okay, next, energy production. Does it use oxygen or does it not use oxygen? And again, all of these muscle cells, all of our cells can do both, but some of these cells are great at anaerobic and some of them are great at aerobic. And so again, if you're a fast switch fiber, you are completing quick explosive bursts of energy, right? Um, and so you would probably be using anaerobic Right, um, and then you know this tapers off pretty quickly. Right, so explosive strong bursts and then low endurance. And so anaerobic and fast twitch fibers and slow twitch fibers are particularly adapted to aerobic respiration. Okay, um, abundance of glycogen. Right, some of these cells have lots of glycogen, some of them don't have much glycogen. And so if you remember back to anaerobic versus aerobic um, energy sources. Remember that anaerobic um, needs glucose, and of course glucose um, is stored in glycogen molecules. And so fast twitch fibers actually have a lot more glycogen in them than slow twitch fibers do. Okay, slow twitch fibers, um, as we'll see, have a different kind of energy source. Okay, um, particularly uh, the slow twitch fibers um, would have more, um, more lipids instead, right? Remember that lipids can um, be used in aerobic respiration, but not in anaerobic respiration, All right? So there's actually more lipids than there is glycogen. Okay, so capillaries. Um, remember that capillaries are part of your cardiovascular system. They carry blood, blood carries oxygen. So which of these types of cells would need more oxygen delivered? Well, that would be aerobic, right? Aerobic needs air. And so the capillary supply to these slow twitch fibers is much, much greater. Um, something we haven't talked about yet, but is also super important, um, myoglobin, right? We've all heard of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen within the blood. Um, myoglobin, stores oxygen in the myo in the muscles. And so um, again, which of these muscle fibers would need more oxygen? Well, of course the aerobic respiration and therefore there is more myoglobin in the slow twitch fibers. Um, and so this presence of myoglobin as well as the um, abundance of capillaries actually changes the color of the fibers. Okay, and so um, the slow twitch fibers are actually going to be red or darker because myoglobin is red, just like your blood. Um, and the fast twitch fibers are not going to be as red. They're going to be lighter in color. Um, and so I show you guys these chicken uh, pieces here um, because um, the legs are the dark meats, right? They're redder in color and the breast meat is whiter in color. Um, and so, um, if any of you guys have ever been around chickens, or even if you haven't, um, maybe you know that um, chickens spend a lot of time just standing around and like using their legs to scratch through um, 
bugs and grass and whatever. Um, and so they need a lot of endurance in their leg muscles to hold up, you know, their, their big fat bodies. Um, and so lots and lots of endurance is necessary in their legs. However, um, their uh, breast muscles um, are what are actually responsible for flying, right? So the way that birds fly is not muscles in their wings necessarily, it's um, their pectoral muscles actually. Um, and so, um, unlike what Chicken Run tells you, chickens can fly, just not for very long. Um, and so generally, um, if chickens are scared by something, right, if they see your dog run by or fox or whatever, they will explode, they will fly as quickly as they possibly can up to safety and then they'll stop. And so essentially their pectoralis muscles, their breast meat, um, needs to have a lot of strength to lift their bodies up off the ground but they don't really need to fly for very long. And so, um, unlike humans, chickens have distributed their fast and slow, slow twitch fibers to, you know, the fast being the breast meat, explosive bursts of movement versus slow twitch in the legs, this dark meat, um, because of additional myoglobin, because of additional capillaries, also, um, you know, the, the chicken legs are a lot fattier, a lot greasier than the white breast meat because they have more lipids, right? Because aerobic respiration uses lipids, not just glycogen. Um, on the same note, um, mitochondria, right? Aerobic respiration utilizes mitochondria, anaerobic does not. And so, of course, all of these muscle cells have mitochondria, but aerobic respiration requires them, and so you'll actually see more mitochondria in the aerobic fibers. Okay, um, and final um, really important note here, um, the size, right? So if you look at a runner versus a bodybuilder, right, you know that both of them are super strong, they're very athletic, very in shape, but the bodybuilder's muscles are huge, and the runner's muscles, albeit very strong, are a lot skinnier, and so the reason for that is that the muscles of um, the runner, right, long-term runner, um, are mostly slow twitch fibers, and slow twitch fibers are generally thinner, right, so the size and strength, um, they're generally thinner fibers, um, yes, they're strong, but not, um, they can't produce quite as much tension um, as the bodybuilder's um, muscles, right? So the bodybuilder's muscles are huge. They produce a lot, a lot of strength, um, and they're thicker um, inherently because fast switch fibers are a lot fatter than slow twitch fibers. Um, oh, and of course, we've been talking about this all along, but of course, fast twitch fibers have really low endurance, right? Chickens fly away for three seconds and then that's it. So very low endurance, high strength, and the slow twitch fibers have exactly the opposite. Okay? Um, this chart um, explains all this in a little bit more of a pretty way here. Um, it shows you fast, slow, and intermediate fibers. Um, way down here, we can see lots of um, different names for these fibers. We can see the difference in colors and so on and so forth. So definitely um, study the differences between the different fiber types with a focus on the fast and slow fibers. Um, okay, uh, in the video that I'm going to post in this, um, in this playlist after my lesson, um, is going to help you review a lot of the things that I'm talking to you guys about. Um, and one of those things, um, I've actually taken, uh, taken a screenshot of what he's talking about, but um, essentially these different fibers um, are organized into different motor units, right? So each motor unit um, is either a type one, a type two A, or a type B. Okay, and so generally um, we recruit um, the type ones first and then so on and so forth. Um, so I have mentioned a few times that, you know, your body is continually reorganizing itself um, based on what you decide to do with your life, right? So if you decide to be um, a marathon runner versus a bodybuilder, your body is going to accommodate over time 
um, those changes in activity. Um, and so um, one of these ways involves actually changing the ratio of uh, fast versus slow twitch fibers in your muscles. Um, and so, you, so you can actually figure out how many of these muscles, uh, muscle fibers are active in your body by doing these, um, these exercises here. So that's just for your own purposes um, if you're curious about how many of each type you have. Okay. And again, training changes this. Um, and so the one thing we haven't talked about to increase the tension of your muscles is actually like working out, okay? actually growing your muscles. Um, of course, you go to the gym over and over again, whether you're running or whether you are um, bodybuilding, your muscles are going to grow, right? And so how exactly does that happen? Well, training causes what's called mu muscle hypertrophy. This is growth. It sounds really bad. It's growing your muscles. So that seems to be a good thing. Um, when your muscles are used, right? So when you go to the gym, you work out um, for the first time in a long time, essentially what happens is those muscle cells um, tear, right? And so we can see up here um, in an image from a peer reviewed paper um, is that um, you work your muscles so hard you damage them, right? And that sounds like a bad thing, but actually this damage releases signals, right? So paracrine signaling, the muscle cell talking to surrounding cells. And these surrounding cells um, are called satellite cells, right? If we look down here to the fascicle, we can see lots of um, individual muscle fibers and wrapped within that paramecium, we can see satellite cells as well. Okay, and so when the satellite cells get the message that the myocytes have been damaged within their little fascicle, what they're going to do is turn on genes, right? So change gene expression to undergo mitosis after mitosis after mitosis, right? So that's what we can see up here. Satellite cells start to replicate. Um, and those daughter cells of the satellite cells are actually going to fuse together with all of their organelles, right? So lots of mitochondria, lots of nuclei into one um, cell. And so essentially that um, conglomeration, multinucleate uh, satellite cell glob is essentially then going to fuse to those muscle cells, right? So this damage is going to be healed. And then these um, fused satellite cells are actually going to add themselves onto the existing muscle cell. So um, what this does is it increases the diameter. And so it increases the diameter of the cell, therefore your muscle just physically got bigger. Um, also, it's going to be donating more nuclei and organelles. So more nuclei mean more transcription, more translation, therefore making more actinomyosin, more actin and myosin means more cross bridges can be formed, more cross bridges forming um, means more strength. And so you have literally just increased the strength of your muscle by increasing its diameter, as well as um, you know, adding these uh, satellite cells and all their components. Okay. Um, once again, um, I told you that after this, um, after my lecture, you should go forth and watch um, this um, next video here. Um, I highly recommend watching the entire thing because it's a great review and he does a great job like drawing these things out, um, making it really clear. And so if some of this stuff seems a little bit too complex, um, maybe watch this entire thing. Um, it's not mandatory. What you absolutely should watch, however, is, um, starting at 22 minutes and 58 seconds, he starts to talk about uh, delayed onset muscle soreness. And so this is essentially where, um, you know, <laughs> the gym's finally open back up again, you finally get to go back to the gym. Um, and so you work out for the first time in months and the next day and the day after that, you like can't get up off the couch anymore. And so what the heck is going on with that? Um, and so he does a great job of explaining this definitely watch uh, at least that component after this lecture. Um, and so uh, just to summarize um, what he will be talking about, um, the, uh, the soreness you get after a couple days is actually um, due to inflammation, right? So actually due to your muscles trying to heal themselves and those satellite cells proliferating, um, pretty much anytime cell division is happening a lot, um, you're going to get kind of soreness, right? So for example, um, when you are uh, fighting a cold, for example, right, you breathe in 
the cold, your tonsils, um, for example, um, take in those, take in the cold and your, uh, your white blood cells are going to start replicating so that they recognize that cold that's already in your body and so they can start attacking um, that cold. Um, and so your, um, your tonsils and your nodes get sore. Um, essentially, the reason for that is that your white blood cells are undergoing mitosis after mitosis. Um, so proliferation of any cells are going to make, um, make the structure um, larger and a little bit sore. Um, so that's absolutely what's happening in our muscles. And again, um, he does a great job of explaining that. Okay, and so um, on the other hand, um, if you are not going to the gym all the time and you are just sitting on the couch eating candy bars, your muscles can start to atrophy. Um, and so this, to an extent, is a normal part of the human existence. Um, as you get older, um, we lose a certain amount of muscle mass every year. Um, and instead of replacing this tissue with contractile tissue, right? So instead of complete regeneration, instead um, fibrosis happens, right? So what we talked about earlier this term, um, fat and fibrous tissue are of course not contractile. And so you will lose um, muscle strength over the course of your life. Um, to an extent, of course, like if you're still using your muscles, um, you can still maintain a lot of that strength. Um, also, depending on your lifestyle, you will have um, a certain degree of muscle atrophy, right? So if you have a sedentary lifestyle, um, again, sitting on the couch eating candy bars, um, if you don't move it, you lose it, right? And so if you're not actually uh, telling your muscles, I need the strength, I need the strength, they're not going to invest energy in maintaining that, uh, those structures, those proteins, those, um, tissues. And so once they are broken down, it just goes away. It's not replaced anymore. Um, and so this isn't just, you know, watching Netflix all day. This can also be um, after injury, after a surgery. Um, it has been shown that people lose um, about 1% of muscle strength every day that they're in bed. And so before, um, you know, after a surgery or a knee replacement or something, um, patients would sit in bed for a couple weeks until they started to heal. Um, but then what they found was that these patients lost so much muscle mass that they actually couldn't recover um, nearly as much. So at this point, um, like the day of or the day after you have surgery, you're getting up out of bed um, and starting PT. Okay. Um, usually um, muscle atrophy results in the loss of myofibrils, right? So not the cells, but the cylinders within those cells. Um, again, if you don't move it, you lose it. And so these myofibrils start to break down over time. Um, this is not the case with certain diseases, right? So we watched a clip about uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and it said that um, because of the repeated tears of those muscles and the um, reduction in healing time as you get older, um, the muscle cells, the myocytes, are actually replaced by fat and scar tissue. Um, and so once you lose muscle cells, you cannot replace them, right? And we're talking about skeletal muscle, we're talking about cardiac muscle, right? So if you have a heart attack and some of your cardiac muscle cells die, that's it. There's no replacing them. And so you will forever not have that strength in your heart or in your muscles because you cannot replace muscle cells. Um, and so something that seems particularly relevant right now, um, or increasingly relevant um, for the past uh, couple decades, um, is what happens in space, right? So of course in space there's no gravity, and so when you move you are not resisting, or gravity is not resisting your movement. And so it takes of course much less effort to move your body in space. And so um, again, if you're not continually telling your body, hey, you need to have the strength, you need to have the strength, what I want to do with my life requires the strength, so you better be strong enough to do so, your tissues actually start to break down. Um, and so um, our next lesson, we'll be talking about bones and how they're built up. Um, essentially, uh, your bones, just like muscles, uh, or actually your bones in particular, are continually remodeling themselves and replacing themselves, right? You have cells that like burrow into your bones and eat holes through them and then replace that bone um, pretty much immediately. But if your bones 
aren't resisting gravity, if they don't need to be super strong, maybe once those cells burrow into your bones, there's no need to replace that anymore. And so it turns out that when you're in space for a long time, um, or not even for that long, right? Just a couple months, as you can see here, um, you come back with osteoporosis, right? So you come back with much, much weaker bones um, because you didn't need them to be strong for so long. Okay. Um, also, uh, there's a lot of muscle mass or muscle loss, right? So if you lose 1% of your muscle strength every day that you're in bed, you can imagine that even if you're moving in space, there's no resistance. And so you don't have to be as strong. Um, and so this isn't even just, uh, you know, moving your limbs, it can even uh, result in a difficulty in moving your eyes, right? So all of your muscles don't have to work so hard. Okay. Um, and actually, a few years ago now, uh, there was um, a pretty interesting study using two twins. Um, one twin went to the International Space Station, the other twin stayed um, stayed on the ground. And then after um, a year, year and a half of living on the space station, um, they compared the two twins, right, to essentially look at um, bone loss, muscle loss, and then other cool things um, like epigenetics and telomeres. So essentially how um, your longevity, right, how long you're going to live is actually affected by being in space. So I definitely recommend looking up um, that study. It's really, really interesting. Um, and so why the heck am I bringing this up? Well, just like, um, it's like the last lecture, the lecture before, um, I talked about how you as physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech therapists, even, um, you might be working with people that not only have had their heads reattached, have had head transplants for better or worse, um, but also you might be working with people that have been in space. Right, so helping them to regain the strength that they lost just from living in an anti-gravity environment. Okay, um, and so the last thing I want to bring up, um, just because um, you know, you guys might be athletes or no athletes, um, you may have experienced what folks sometimes call the wall, right? And so this is um, part of a very rigorous exercise. Um, and so if you try to sprint. For a while, right? So longer than, you know, 100 meter dash or something. If you're trying to really push your body hard, you are stimulating lots and lots of motor units, right? And so as we know, motor units, um, more motor units um, stimulated means that you need lots and lots more ATP because you are completing more cross bridge cycles. And so you are essentially burning through your glycogen pretty darn quickly, right? And so this process um, of actually burning through glycogen um, is completed in the liver. Um, and so you can keep on doing what you're doing um, so long as that activity does not exceed the liver's rate of breaking down glycogen, okay? Um, so again, you can keep on running as long as it's not so hard so fast that the liver physically cannot keep up. Um, if you keep going, however, um, and this glyco, um, and th this processing of glycogen is not quite enough to keep up with your needs, um, you have to shift to blood glucose, right? So as we can see here, um, the y-axis of this graph shows um, what is actually being used to generate ATP. Um, and so we can see that blood glucose is going to become increasingly important as you get farther into an exercise, right? So this is um, in minutes. So glucose is really important, um, as we can see here, when our glycogen levels are depleted, right? Just like we talked about earlier in this lecture. Um, but of course, your blood glucose isn't an indefinite source, um, you are going to deplete your blood glucose fairly quickly as well. Okay, and so when this happens, you start to rely more and more and more on fatty acids, right? So a longer exercise, right? Here's two hours and so on and so forth. Um, you're burning through fat, hooray, that's exciting. But if you keep pushing yourself so hard um, that you completely deplete your blood glucose, that is going to impact 
your brain and your eyes, right? And so um, the wall is often associated with maybe passing out, becoming lightheaded, um, seeing stars, not being able to see whatsoever, right? And so the reason for this is that your brain and retina, right, are always working. Um, and so they require lots and lots of oxygen, lots and lots of blood. And so when the blood no longer has enough glucose in it, your brain and your eyes start to starve, right? So they can't complete their own functions because there's not enough sugar in order to do so. And so again, the wall, um, if you keep on pushing yourself harder and harder for hours, right, you lose your vision, right? You lose your mental activity and usually um, you pass out, right? And so, um, completing these more long-term exercises, right? So if you're gonna, um, you know, be an Ironman, um, you need to balance and train for the burning of carbohydrates versus generating glucose. Um, and so just a little bit um, of information for you guys there, um, not exam worthy. Yeah, okay, so thank you guys very much. Um, for watching this today. Uh, from here, you should complete your PhysioX exercise, um, which is using the content from this lecture as well as a little bit from the previous lecture as well. Um, also, you should watch minimally the delayed onset muscle soreness component of the next video in this playlist. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Um, I will uh, see you. Uh, See you next time.